Thank you to all of you who came on a Saturday morning. Uh, I know many of the people were up late last night watching the Muckrakers, and uh, so we're grateful to those of you who came. Uh, we are live streaming uh, this discussion, so I, th I think most people who are a little hungover are probably in their hotel rooms watching on live streaming right now. Um, so we have a great session this morning. Uh, many of you had a little bit of an introduction to this on Thursday morning when we had a panel discussion uh, right off the bat that Raphael was part of. But we're going to go a little more in-depth today about uh, investigative reporting in one of the most repressive places in the world. So let me do a brief introduction of Raphael, and then he's going to speak for a little bit, and then we'll do a little Q&A and open it up for your questions. Uh, Rafael Marquez de Moraes is the editor of Maca Angola. He is an investigative journalist and anti-corruption activist, obviously from Angola. Educated at Oxford, he began his career in journalism at the state-owned newspaper Journal de Angola, but was soon fired for his articles critical of President José Eduardo dos Santos. In 1999, his articles also landed him in jail for the first time. Uh, he has since gone, back, gone on to doing work on human rights abuses and corruption in the resource-rich resource African country. In 2003, he wrote Cabinda, A Year of Pain, a catalog of hundreds of human rights abuses. And in 2011, his book Blood Diamonds, Corruption and Torture in Angola, he described the killing and terrorizing of villagers by private security companies and Angola military officials in the name of protecting mining operations. He has received several international prizes for his efforts from organizations ranging from the U.S. National Association of Black Journalists to the Index on Censorship. In May of this year, he was convicted of defaming a group of generals through his expose of abuse and corruption in the Angolan diamond fields. So he's going to tell us a little bit about his techniques for doing this very tough investigative reporting and uh, why he keeps doing it. So I'll turn it over to Raphael. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning. Um, I also wished I could uh, watch it live stream because I set the <laughs> alarm clock for 7.45 but forgot about it to, to press. <laughs> and um, I, I just want to say that um, I was born and raised in Angola, so I grew into that system of uh, war and corruption. And I always believed that... Um, it is possible in that environment to, to change, uh, to have a different attitude. And uh, why? Because um, from a very early age, uh, my dream was that when I reached 18, there would be no war in the country, so I would not have to go and serve in the war. And I grew and I still made it to the military for a very brief period. Uh, actually, it was one of the punishments for uh, being critical in the state newspaper. One day I went to work and there was a letter uh, basically sending me to the army uh, as a punishment. Uh, and also because I was under the military age, which was until 35. Uh, so it's in that belief and the experiences I've had uh, that have led me to build a career on investigating abuses. Uh, so as a way also of preventing that they would continue um, to, be, to be perpetuated, to be perpetuated as part of uh, what some people call our way of life, which I believe is not what the Constitution says, nor the ordinary people uh, believe should be the way for them to live. Uh, so in the Diamond areas, for instance, uh, and I've been investigating it since '92. Initially, I would be sent there because no one in the state newspaper would want to cover the Diamond Arias, simply because in the state newspaper, which is the only daily newspaper in the country to date, uh, journalists knew what they had to write about. So there was no question of censorship. It was a question of obeying uh, the party line. And uh, I didn't grow up with that party line uh, so to speak, uh, or under the influence of the state security. So I would write what I thought I had learned in the course. Uh, and that's what always got me into trouble. But the first time I traveled around the Diamond Arias uh, by helicopter, uh, the pilot was explaining to me how they would just go around gunning down the, from the helicopters the miners, illegal miners. 
uh, very normally like a normal conversation and say, well, and sometimes they would shoot at us, but uh, boy, we would just go there and uh, kill scores of them. And so I started thinking, why would you just uh, kill scores of people? For what reason? For diamonds? If it is to protect diamonds, why don't you have a system that enables also the local population to benefit from the resources? Because these are the most impoverished. The richer the area in Angola, the more impoverished the people are. And in the diamond areas, you don't find infrastructures, you don't find the basics. And uh, three years ago, the president went there and said, well, diamonds are not enough to build a kilometer of road. That's what he said on the <laughs> record. And so we have to take money from oil revenues to come and build here. And Angola makes over a billion dollars a year in diamonds, simply because it is concentrated, also is a business concentrated uh, in the presidential family. Now the president's daughter controls uh, the whole um, uh, network of selling diamonds, Angolan diamonds abroad, uh, in an illegal scheme as well. So those are the issues I started paying attention to. And then the moment I felt I was ready to write reports to uh, disclose some of this information, I did so in 2004. Uh, I wrote the first report in the Diamond Areas because I had so much information and I did not have an outlet, so I decided to write it as a book format. Uh, but essentially it's an investigation that I carried out in the area. Um, and ever since I've been regularly publishing uh, reports on the abuses in the Diamond Areas, in 2011 I met with a publisher in Portugal and I didn't have the resources to publish the report. I had registered over 500 cases of uh, human rights abuses, uh, more than 100 people killed, more than 500 tortured, and I had the names. Um, in some instances, for instance, I could even record uh, their relatives, parents. So I had a very compelling uh, list of cases and I needed to write. And I knew who these companies uh, belonged to, a group of influential generals. Uh, so, and, but I didn't have any outlet because in Angola, contrary to other African countries, because of its resources, uh, donors will support the government, not civil society, mm -hmm. to expose human rights abuses, to work on human rights abuses. Uh, and uh, the publisher said, okay, I will print 500 copies of your report if you write it to me, and we will just do a launch, and that will be my contribution to your, uh, to your work. And so it went on eight editions, uh, because people found it interesting to, to read, and I was sued in Portugal by the very same group of generals, and uh, the case was dismissed in Portugal, uh, because my investigations and uh, the evidence I provided were found to be very sound, and in the public interest, they needed to be disclosed, disclosed to the public. But then, the generals decided to prosecute me in Angola, even though the book was published in Portugal. And uh, there I was not convicted of defamation, but of malicious denunciation, mm -hmm. because I felt it a responsibility, having collected all those cases, to hand them to the office of the Attorney General for an inquiry. And so the office of the Attorney General exonerated, because the Attorney General is also an army general, uh, and his deputy is also an army general. So they exonerated their colleagues and then went after me. But I was convicted with no evidence provided in court, no testimonies, uh, the generals themselves never testified in court because they refused and actually called me to try to negotiate, as they put it in brackets, uh, a way out of the situation. They started by asking for $2.5 million and 12 years in prison. And uh, the day I went to the first hearing uh, in court, uh, there were nine charges against me. When the judge read out the charges, there were 15 charges against me. So overnight, without unbeknown to me, the charges had increased. It's a mockery of justice. 
And uh, I was convicted to six months in prison, uh, suspended. And then the generals asked me, said, well, we don't want the trial, and let's simplify it. All we want you to say in court, and we end the case here, is that you, yes, you contacted our companies, you have it, you have the evidence, uh, the emails, you have everything, but the companies never contacted us. So all you have to say is that you never contacted us directly. And we all exonerated. Uh, and then you can go on, do your work, and uh, we can go and do our work. And there was lots of pressure. I would get even phone calls at four in the morning for that uh, throughout the day. And uh, for the first time, my house also was regularly visited by generals uh, in their uniforms. And then I said, OK, if that is the case and it goes away after three years of uh, legal wrangling, let's do it. And now, that was the best part. Then the, they withdrew their charges. Uh, the complaints. And then the state said, no, we, the state, have nothing to do with the generals. We still convict mm -hmm. you, and there's no need for evidence. Uh, that was essentially the end of uh, the case. Um, and I've, of course, appealed. But just to explain how the judicial system in Angola works, uh, there is a gentleman in the oil-rich uh, exclave of Cabinda, up north in Angola, where we take uh, most of our oil. Just last um, month, uh, he was convicted to six years in prison for rebellion when he was caught getting out of the church. And the reason why he was convicted to six years in prison, it's because he had called for a protest to denounce the management of oil resources in that region. He did not investigate. He just said, well, there are problems here with the management of the resources, and I want to hold a protest. And the provincial authorities told him no. He went to church, he was arrested, and charged with rebellion. And uh, He's been in jail now for over seven, almost close to seven months, and will stay there for six years. Uh, Fifteen young people, uh, one of which is now in critical condition because has been on a hunger strike for uh, 19 days now. Um, their crime was to, they tried to hold protests uh, and were severely tortured on several occasions. So they decided to organize a class and study methods of uh, nonviolent resistance. And they were arrested while reading the books of Jean Sharp and other uh, theories on nonviolence, Gandhi, uh, and others, and charged with plotting a coup to overthrow the president. And the evidence was uh, that at some point they were discussing burning tires to halt the advance of the police or something. And then it was claimed that if the president was passing, that could suffocate the president, and therefore it was an attempt against the life of the president. But it gives you a context of the judicial system we have in Angola. So, and the context in which I have to carry out my investigations uh, on corruption. But also what is critical, and here you cannot detach corruption from human rights abuses, because Angola has a fairly democratic constitution, mm -hmm. which grants uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press. But... The way the ruling party has entrenched itself in, the pow in power for the past 40 years and the president for the past 36 years um, do not allow themselves to seek a transition or a proper uh, a practice of democracy, especially because of corruption. Because they've looted the country and uh, if the day comes, they have to leave the power. There's fear uh, that some of them will have to face uh, consequences for the way they have just uh, taken money from the state coffers. Uh, and that's the main reason why uh, these human rights abuses are essentially to cover up what has been happening with the state resources. So there is a link. Uh, and that's why I cannot just cover corruption, but uh, pay attention to human rights issues. For instance, some of these young people who have been arrested. 
uh, for years they've been trying to protest on issues regarding good governance or bad governance, corruption, uh, because that's the way, and that there's just plenty of evidence on how the president basically transfers state assets to his family and does it very openly. Um, just uh, when I arrived here, I published a, a text on how the president uh, essentially allowed his daughter to go and buy a company in Portugal for over 200 million euros uh, with state money. And she bought the company in Portugal, an energy company called FASEC, and sold it back to the Angolan state. So two profits. Mm -hmm. And then she became a shareholder in the company that bought, <laughs> the state company that bought FASEC, so three profits <laughs> you know, without, but these are the kinds of operations. And uh, there is a presidential decree basically saying you can't sell the company. And uh, it's also possible to get, uh, just yesterday I got the records from Malta uh, with all the articles of incorporation of these new joint ventures set up between the president's daughter and the Angola National Energy Company. And one would wonder, why would the president's daughter and the National Energy Company set up a joint venture in Malta and then it be registered through a presidential decree in Angola? So those are the issues that I try to keep track. Uh, and for that, there is a major consequence, one of which is that it becomes a long work uh, and no resources uh, to speak of. So basically, my investigations are done from my kitchen table. <laughs> and from time to time, I will be visited by my friends from the state security to ensure if uh, the CIA has not installed an apparatus <laughs> in my kitchen to enable me to do <laughs> such investigations. But it's pretty simple. You just uh, check, and quite often we don't pay attention to very simple uh, bureaucratic procedures by state officials. And in the case of Angola, all I have to do is to pay attention to all the decrees assigned by the president and then just follow those decrees if it involves money and I get to see where it goes. But I'll stop here briefly. Okay. Um, have a seat and, and let's chat some more about, about all this. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm really curious about how you carry out these investigations in a country where, you know, in, in the United States or in Western Europe, it's, it's pretty easy to access documents and data. Um, in Angola, I imagine it's quite different in terms of how accessible uh, data is. Tell us a little bit about how you, how you get this. You know, you, you talked about the records you found in Malta. Um, you have to go to other countries to find these records? Or how, how, do, you, how do you find the, uh, the evidence for your stories? Uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, at one point, I had a, a formal job. And then the government negotiated uh, to ensure that I lost that job as well. And, uh, but uh, we Angolans have a sort of a very interesting sense of humor. So a ranking official called me and said, now we, you're going to lose your job because we just negotiated that. But if you feel yourself hard pressed, we can offer you uh, a job. And then uh, as I was jobless, I decided to go to an office to just look for a document, a state office. And then I found some interesting materials about the ownership of a company by some government officials. Then I decided, I said, but how do they have it here? So every single day I would go there and take pictures of the documents and things. And someone one day passed and said, are you going crazy or what? <laughs> Like, you've lost your job, you come here every day, what are you doing? And they ignored me. So for nearly a year, I didn't say a word, and I would go there all scruffy and just sit there very quietly, mining all the data, as much data as I could. So the day they found out what I was doing, it was too late, because I had already built up mm -hmm. a very interesting database uh, that actually I took from... Public documents. Uh, public documents. Uh, 
and then I learned later on that they disposed of all those uh, documents and set up a digital system that is far more complicated uh -huh. for people to access and search for uh, documents. Uh, I think it has to do with the will and the conviction and the skills mm -hmm. and also the belief that uh, even in the most corrupt societies, there are people who are really against it and are willing to help. And also where you have much corruption, you have no loyalties, mm -hmm. you, know, you have clients, uh, you have interests. Uh, I remember, for instance, um, I learned of a $70 million deal because the government official who benefited from that deal refused to pay $3,000 to an individual. And the individual basically gave me the gave documents. You the info. Yeah. Do you have so, sources within the government as well? Of course. Yeah. I have sources everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way the government has um, people standing by my gate and keeping tabs on me, I also keep tabs on them. Mm -hmm. It is only fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, tell me a little bit about um, other journalists in Angola. Are, are there others trying to do good investigative reporting, or are you kind of a lone wolf? At the moment, I wouldn't say they're more trying to do investigative journalism uh, for one very simple reason. Much of uh, what exists of the private media is under the control of uh, either government officials disguised as uh, private um, business people or business people who have been mandated by uh, the intelligence to buy the papers mm -hmm. uh, to have them under control. And also, nowadays, for instance, uh, the weekly newspapers, we have some 10 titles, none of which prints more than 5,000 copies a week. Mm -hmm. So it's very marginal. Just in the capital, we have over 6 million people. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is very marginal. What has become now the last frontier for freedom of expression is um, the internet. And so the social media is most active now. And even some of the private newspapers who try to escape the state control, for instance, will reprint my articles mm -hmm. and the others uh, that come out on the internet and are critical. Um, and just to see, for instance, uh, on Facebook, um, this article I mentioned about the president's daughter, uh, within 24 hours, there were over 60,000 readers just for that particular article. And just on, uh, on the main page, on Facebook, and not mobile Facebook, which also attracts, um, because especially in the provinces, people will read through their mobile phones. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's quite... Uh, and the government is also trying to come up with a legislation designed to uh, close that space. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, uh, the National Assembly um, passed the draft uh, law, uh, basically giving the government absolute powers to curb any criticisms on the internet. Mm -hmm. And one of which is that uh, only public institutions and state media are allowed to mention uh, government officials without their written consent. Wow. That's amazing. And you violate that all the time, I assume. The draft was passed but was not uh, affected into okay. law because it became so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there international pressure against it what, or, or, or domestic? No, do, this time domestic pressure because uh, no one could post anything on Facebook without the written consent of the third party mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not post your picture on my <laughs> Facebook page without uh, seeking your right, written mm -hmm. consent. But of course, these laws are written with uh, always with a caveat. And the caveat is if you are okay with it, then it's not a problem. Yeah. 
But of course, government officials would always have a problem being mentioned mm -hmm. without their written consent. Mm -hmm. And so that was basically a way to say, no one will be able to write about the president and his family and government officials without them authorizing and writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a country, and just to see, you mentioned international pressure. Uh, as I mentioned these cases, uh, the secretary, the deputy minister of uh, Norwegian Foreign Affairs just recently went to Angola and uh, he was the only person who saw uh, an improvement on the human rights situation in the country. Mm -hmm. So quite often it plays an opposite role by trying, in this case we know why, you know. Statoil, which is a Norwegian um, state oil company, has its largest investment outside Norway in Angola. Mm. So that is to protect the oil interests. Mm -hmm. The European Parliament recently passed a resolution condemning the Angolan government for human rights uh, abuses. Uh, and the voting was overwhelming, 550 votes uh, condemning the government and only 14 uh, against it. And yet you have a country with major interests and a country that we've always believed to be uh, engaged in the defense of human rights going to the country at this moment when things are worse mm -hmm. to say, no, 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 you be cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the situation is improving mm -hmm. because the government needs that legitimacy that cannot find among its own people. Right. And so to have that legitimacy, it trades the state resources the natural resources for that international legitimacy. Uh, that's why it's very, very difficult to really know what is happening in Angola because of the spin-offs that are created by uh, those who partake in the loading of the country. I see a lot of parallels between Angola and Azerbaijan, which we've been talking about yes. a fair amount this week with Khadija Ismailova in prison there for her reporting. Another oil-rich country where international governments are loath or reluctant to criticize the government too heavily because they, they want the oil. Um, so do you, that, that brings me back to the case that's against you right now. Khadija's in jail. Mm -hmm. There is a possibility that you'll go to jail. Tell us a little bit about uh, the current, the case that just happened against you and where it stands right now. Uh, at the moment, there is an appeal at the Supreme Court, but the way the Angolan judicial system works, uh, it's a question of a political decision. Uh, with me, the authorities know I'm always ready to go to jail. You know, uh, I'm always ready to face the consequences of my uh, reporting. And so I tell them many time, you're welcome. Uh, and why, for instance, uh, during my trial, some of the youth tried to protest outside the courtroom and they were tortured mm -hmm. and uh, locked up for several hours. Um, just there is no, that space of freedom of expression is, uh, has been taken. And the, the way to get it back is by fighting for it. Uh, and that's when one becomes more than a journalist and becomes an activist mm -hmm. because you have to fight for that space to have the right to publish because the government uh, makes people believe that rights are a privilege. Mm -hmm. And not something that people have inherently. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and those then who behave well mm -hmm. will have the privilege of uh, enjoying those rights. Mm -hmm accepted the right to freedom of expression, of course. Um, and if we don't fight against it, these perceptions, if we don't help to change um, the mentality, uh, and for that we need to lead by example, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we will not have it for granted. Yeah. You know? And uh, democracy is not about what is written in the Constitution. It's about the attitude of the people that make it happen in terms of uh, giving voice to those who don't have and ensuring that um, the space for everyone to express themselves is, uh, is available and is uh, religiously defended. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is what is missing. And quite often people ask me, but uh, aren't you afraid? Yeah. 
and what are the consequences? And I always uh, fire back. Aren't they afraid? Because why it always falls on those, you know, who are trying to push the boundaries, who are trying to do the right things, to have to justify themselves, and those who still kill, you know, mm-hmm. Tell misrule, us yeah. uh, just walk free. And we assume that they have the right to kill, to steal, because they have power. Mm-hmm. The government's uh, efforts against you are not limited to trying to put you in jail. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Maka Angola, and uh, there have been some attacks on Maka Angola. Tell us a little bit, first of all, uh, how you founded it and and what your your your, uh, goal Uh, with it is, and then then what's happened with the government on on trying to shut you down. Uh, Recently, I disclosed how I founded Maka Angola. Uh, once I had harvested plenty of data on corruption, then I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I used some information for my dissertation, uh, my master dissertation, which was on the transparency of looting in Angola, because it's very, very open. Uh, Then um, I went to the beach with some friends who work for the government propaganda, and I was complaining we were having a discussion on social conscience, and then one of them said, look, you know what I do, and it makes me feel bad. Mm. And so, but I can have a good conscience if I help you. And so this person who basically works for the government propaganda designed my website. (laughs) And for uh, a year, my most critical uh, investigations were being uploaded from the same place where propaganda was being crafted (laughs) for the government. I love that. Um, And so this is just to give you an example. So, and of course the intelligence was looking for, because in countries, especially with a background in communism, uh, and in Africa it's quite common as well if uh, they have a sort of anti Uh, colonial stance uh, or anti-imperialist stance, uh, they will always bring up uh, the issue of CIA Mm -hmm. and say, oh, this money is CIA. And so I would just laugh. I say, well, if you only knew where (laughs) (laughs) these articles are being uploaded from. And then um, the server where my uh, website was uh, uh, hosted was uh, attacked. Uh, there was a DDS, uh, I think that's how it is called. DDoS. DDoS attack. And it uh, shut it down for nearly 11 months. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a way to get it back uh, running until finally uh, some friends in the U.S. uh, provided me with uh, assistance uh, to get it back uh, online and uh, in a much more secure server. Mm-hmm. And this server in the U.S. also got a DDoS attack and uh, basically chucked me out of uh, its system not to compromise it. Um, so, and I had to look for another, another host. But now there is some basic security. And what I learned is that uh, we now have uh, in Angola a sort of uh, North Korean um, hackers and uh, Israelis providing, uh, and Germans as well, providing all sorts of uh, capabilities for Mm -hmm. the government to monitor Mm -hmm. uh, the internet and to provide um, digital surveillance on, on the critics. So I've had all sorts of problems with my computer, with my communications. But uh, I have a very basic attitude. If I'm going after their documents and being able to extract them from them, it is only fair that they also come after me and see in my computer what documents I've got on them. (laughs) As long as you don't have sources in there that they can also get to. Uh, Quite often, the sources are more careful Mm -hmm. than I am. Mm -hmm. And so that makes my job much easier. And of course, there's always retaliations, and quite often uh, unjustly against people who have nothing to do with uh, uh, 
uh, with my writings. Mm -hmm. um, because those who have will make sure if they see me in the street will not greet me yeah. and uh, pretend that they don't know me at right. all. Uh, but those are some of my best friends. Um, <laughs> so it is quite curious. Uh, I had cases, uh, for instance, in which um, I was under much pressure by some authorities, and among them they were friends, and they would also pretend to be very mad at me. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a question how you really relate to these individuals and make them understand Mm -hmm. that you're not their enemy, but also that um, whatever they have enshrined in the Constitution, it is to be uh, exercised, and we will fight for it. And if we have to go against their interests, we will do so uh, with our strength. Yeah. Um, because we look at this, uh, at Africa now, and... Uh, we want to have a positive narrative. And for years, uh, reportings coming out of Angola were extremely positive on this economic boom and things going great. And so the few of us who stood on the ground saying, things are not great, mm -hmm. uh, there is much stealing and this is not sustainable. Uh, our voices got muffled by this narrative mm -hmm. of uh, success story. Right. What we have now, after billions of dollars that streamed into the Angolan economy, is that much of that money basically was parked outside as investments in Portugal, in Brazil, in China, uh, elsewhere in Europe. And now we have the highest uh, child mortality rate in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, health services do not work in Angola. You go to a hospital, it's just uh, uh, to cry. Uh, the education system in uh, much of the schools throughout the country, uh, children have to take their own um, stools to sit on. Oh, stools. Mm -hmm. You see. So then you say, what narrative is this that mm -hmm. excludes the people from the benefits yeah. of their own resources? You know. Right. Well, let's. Uh, I have a ton more questions, but let's open it up to people in the audience. We'll start over here. Very well done, Raphael. Thank you. Uh, however, uh, my name is Tom Heinemann. I'm from Denmark, a filmmaker and a documentarist. Uh, I'm just uh, a little bit worried about this being live streamed. Um, you could be surveilled right now by the lawyer of uh, the president. And uh, when you show up in your airport, they might uh, have downloaded the whole uh, live streaming here. And this is also a question for the organizers. Is it wise to live stream a debate like this? Uh, but you, you seem to not to care, but I'm a, bit, I'm a little bit worried for you. Uh, three weeks ago, I returned from South Africa, and my passport was taken away uh, at the airport. And then I say, why? They said, well, what kind of problems do you have with the government? Because this is serious. And, um, and I was taken to the repatriation room. So then I just thought, where are they going to repatriate me to <laughs> if I'm Angola? Then it took a while for them to figure out and someone to come and apologize and say, we had a banning order for you not to leave the country. And uh, fortunately you left, so, and it was a mistake to ban you from entering the country because the order was to prevent you from leaving uh, the country. <laughs> and, uh, and I returned. And on the 12th of September, on my return, uh, I organized uh, a solidarity meeting with these uh, young activists. And over a 1,000 people showed up. And it was live streamed. And I had the families of the prisoners and everyone speaking out. Uh, and there is a small FM radio that also broadcast it live. Uh, one of the main weapons uh, authoritarian regimes use is fear. And that's the first weapon we must destroy, you know. Fear. 
Why should I be afraid? What have I done wrong? You know, if they have evidence that anything I'm saying here is uh, defamation, then they can sue me and use the courts. But if it is to threaten me because I'm speaking the truth, then I will say, well, I will speak it a thousand times. Because these people have been in power for 40 years. That's how we allow criminals to capture the state and run it and destroy the lives of millions of people. You know. Does international attention, the awards you've won, being at panels like this, does that help in any way to give you a sense, you know, a, a bit of uh, support that makes it harder to persecute you? Uh, I was convicted after receiving the Index on Censorship right. okay. Award. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens. Um, what it does is that it provides a moral reference uh, that people in society take it very seriously because... Uh, we have a system whereby those uh, who do, who are very corrupt, are the ones who uh, project themselves as the social references mm -hmm. because they have the big cars, the big houses, and the luxury. And so those are the ones people should emulate. Uh, when individuals like myself prove that that's not the way it should be, those are the corrupt. Mm -hmm. Those are the bad guys. And that corruption is not cool. As a Nigerian friend uh, once told me, he said, well, Raphael, the problem in Africa is that these guys make corruption seem very cool. And we have to undo it. Mm -hmm. you know, Make it what it is, a crime. Yeah. Okay. So then there are the references. Like, um, it is being live streamed. They see me with a nice shirt. And then I say, well, I haven't stolen <laughs> to buy this shirt. It was a gift, <laughs> you know, from a friend. So I say, well, you know, you're always appearing. Uh, and just as a joke, uh, like my sister was always telling me, you know, when you go to these conferences, try at least to change your ties and uh, <laughs> so you don't appear always with the same ties or the same suits, because I had two. And then, <laughs> and then a friend... Uh, <laughs> Got so upset. She said, "No, no, no! I have some. Uh, I have a shop, and offered me some uh, some suits, and uh, one of which I used to receive the Index on Censorship Award. And I always make jokes about it because you always find even people of goodwill to offer you ties to say, okay, you know, you are an activist, mm -hmm. and uh, you should be well presented. Right. And so here, have a tie or have a shirt <laughs> or something." Uh, yeah. That's when you take it uh, with um, some sense of humor because mm -hmm. you understand what people mean by that. It's, a, it's a way of supporting you, yeah. And it's a way of saying not only the corrupt dress well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 All right, other questions? Yes, right here in the second row. Thank you. My name is Eni Mulia from Indonesia. Well, you are, I'm so inspired with you, Mr. Morales. You seem very ready to go to jail. But I think you, I believe you must have some kind of uh, self-protection mechanism. Because, uh, well, like, I'm, well, considering maybe it's uh, somebody is revealing on you, maybe it's just your key basic principles, like do you encrypt your uh, database or you uh, never traveling alone? or And also, uh, you... I, uh, you said you also work with your sources. How do you protect your sources who might be also could be in danger? Thank you. Uh, I don't have uh, self-defense mechanisms. Uh, a 16-year-old uh, young man, I was just recently in Canada, he asked me that question, and I said, you know, when you live in the lion's den, you don't feel the lion's breath, because you live there with them. Uh, my house is uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes walk from the presidential palace. You know. And uh, the presidential palace has uh, these 
you know, extraordinary guard of uh, thousands of people, <laughs> what mechanism can I put in place <laughs> that will avert the head of the military intelligence, lots of senior intelligence of officials live in my neighborhood, or I live in their neighborhood, <laughs> uh, ministers and others. Uh, so I'm there. Uh, they know my gate. Uh, there was actually, it's, it, this is true, but it seems like a joke. Uh, the square I live has a small uh, sort of garden uh, common uh, that was named after the president uh, as a children's uh, and uh, playground and library uh, president to Shantos. And uh, the library was, this was inaugurated in 2001, and the library never worked. And then it was burned to the ground, and that's where the command post for the surveillance around me was set up. And it became a garbage dump, uh, the square. And as it became a garbage dump, I think they moved out the, <laughs> the command post and then uh, I keep saying, I didn't chase them away. It was the garbage <laughs> <laughs> that chased them away <laughs> from the park. Sometimes we do not pay attention to the fragilities of these regimes because we are too consumed by our own security that we forget they're as human as we are. And some of them are re relatives. So the same way they look for our weaknesses and our strength, and they spend days uh, analyzing us, what do we eat, how do we do? Uh, when I went to, uh, and we have to do the same, you know. Like, I'll, I'll just give this very brief example. Um, we have a real bad man there who's the head of the military intelligence, and he doesn't live far from me. Uh, he is evil. So one day I said, okay, I'll investigate this man. I'll investigate him. And I found out that he had set up a company using his home address, and he's the head of the military intelligence. And the daughter was using that company with his home address to sell intelligence services to the father for $3 million a year. And the daughter had studied environment in the US. And they called me CIA. I didn't study in the US. <laughs> um, and I exposed it. I exposed the whole scam. And there was even an American involved in their business operations. And I had the name of the man, and I even had the number of his passport. And I disclosed it. I said, now sue me. Because, again, uh, what makes us really believe that these individuals are so powerful is our fear. What about the second part of that question, You're protecting your sources? One thing that I do not do is to engage with my sources in public, is to engage with my sources, uh, be friends with them. And so to give you an idea, for over a year now, I'm trying to get uh, some interesting documents from someone, and I haven't been able to do that yet just because of that concern of protecting the source. When it happens, it will be a blast. But until we figure out a way, uh, I just... Uh, you won't do the story. I won't do the yeah. story. Okay. And sometimes I will have documents um, that I will not publish for a year or two until the traces to the source are forgotten or erased. Uh, so there are mechanisms that uh, one can't put in place effectively. Uh, I do not worry about me, but I worry about uh, others who come into contact with me. And um, 
but often as well, uh, as I explained before, if I pay attention to what is coming out in public, I can write a great investigation without having to rely on uh, much sources. I explained, for instance, uh, just uh, at the beginning, when I spoke uh, about um, this energy, yeah. I, I did an investigation on oil, how the National Oil Company, which is state-owned, provided, provided a $730 million loan to some government officials. I had the story, I had the documents, Fortunately, I had one of the beneficiaries on the record say, yes, that's how we got the loan. And uh, I said, and why did the oil company wrote off the debt? And he said, no, we are trying to pay. But they told us, well, we wrote off the debt, go to the Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance said, go elsewhere. And so I put all that in my uh, investigation. And now... Again, what is uh, the levels of impunity are so high that no official will be prosecuted for corruption unless false from the president's grace. Even in those cases, they will not be prosecuted for corruption. They will only lose their jobs uh, because of the president not liking them or something. But for the public, it's important that this information is made available so that they can... Uh, make up their own minds on what type of government they have and officials uh, they have ruling uh, the country. Let's take another question. Uh, I want to go over to this side over here on the left. My name is Ahmad Isa from Nigeria. Um, let me start by praying that um, God gives you a government that will intervene just like the government we have now in Nigeria. Number two, even though you seem not to be afraid, but I fear for you. I feel for you seriously. I, this is more like a suggestion. The organizers of this conference should see what they can do to give this man maximum protection. If this man goes to prison, I am not sure he will come back alive. With what I have been able to um, dig up on Angola, Angola is worse than Nigeria. If this man goes to prison, he may not come out alive. He doesn't have money, but he has the courage. He has the will. And I feel the organizers of this conference should challenge all of us, not in this hall alone, or everyone that is um, in attendance. I mean the whole of the conference, to see what we can do, even if it means raising, even if it is one one dollar each for this man to support what he is doing, even if it means making him comfortable out of Angola to operate. Hence, he has his contacts over there, how he gets his information, how he operates, yes, you have to be alive for you to, do, to continue what you're doing. Well said. Once you are eliminated, it is the end of the story. What, what can we do for you, first question, and second question, uh, kind of uh, concrete question that came out of that. Could you leave Angola? Would you, do you, have you considered it? No. No? No. Uh, I've lived abroad, and uh, I want to live in my country, and I will live in my country. Uh, I will not, uh, at this point in my life, uh, uh, leave the country because uh, 
of fear. I understand what my brother from Nigeria has said, and um, it's a concern for my family as well. But uh, I will remain in the country, and I will continue to do my work there. Of course, it's important, and I have been uh, privileged to enjoy much international uh, support uh, in the form, for instance, the resolution passed by the European Parliament mentions my case, uh, and the government is trying to justify, and that's when they, uh, the documents that the government submitted to the European Parliament to justify its actions uh, called me a crusader who for years has been trying to overthrow them. Mm -hmm. uh, how can a one man <laughs> you know, crusade to overthrow an entire government is... Uh, crazy to me. Uh, but it's important to stay in the country. Uh, too many people have left. Too many good people. And uh, that's how what has caused the brain drain that has enabled these crooks mm -hmm. uh, to be so strong uh, and basically to go unchallenged. And there comes a time when we say this must stop and we must hold the line there. Uh, and that's what I will do. Yes, if they put me in prison, they can do anything they want. Uh, I think I'm one of the few people that has been beaten and filmed so that they could show how powerful they were. Uh, I had the commander of the special rapid intervention police stomping on my back while his men were filming. That was... Uh, two years ago, in September 2013, you know, uh, and I was brutally assaulted. And as I was walking out of the courtroom, I went to cover the trial of some protesters um, and to show the strength of their force. Uh, the government sent uh, a convoy of five uh, vehicles, including an assault car with 54 uh, uh, special forces to arrest me, and they encircled the area where I was, so just to show that they really wanted to do it in style. Uh, and again, they can do anything they want, but the point is, within an hour of my arrest, they had to justify why they had arrested me, and they had no justification. And uh, so they abused, yes, they stomped on my back, they filmed it, they enjoyed the film. And I learned that it was the Minister of Interior himself who had given the orders for that to happen. And also for my telephone to be taken to the forensic laboratory to uh, search for uh, my contacts. And I have those very cheap phones uh, when I'm there, I don't use smartphones. So there was nothing in the phone that they could find, uh, not even a love message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what about what we as the international community can do for you? What, how can we help you? Uh, Bank friends. Okay. Bank friends. In this, you have a government that has all these billions of dollars at this disposal. How much money can you raise? to help me fight off billions of dollars. But there's something that is far more important. Solidarity. Mm -hmm. That counts a lot. If I go to jail and you reprint some of my stories and you echo the work that is being done uh, on corruption and human rights, that helps. Uh, the fact, for instance, when I was convicted, the judge ordered that I remove all the contents related to the book from the internet, the opposite happened. Mm. The translation of the book in English was made available as open source uh, on the internet. And several organizations like Index on Censorship and others have posted it on their website. So rather than containing the information, actually it just helped. Yeah to spread the information. And that is the key, because the challenge here is to get the information out 
And so that those individuals are seen for what they are, mm -hmm. criminals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm going to, can I take one more? Do we have time? Yeah. One more. Okay. Over here. Oh, I guess this one over here. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> do we just do the two? And, uh, okay, uh, we'll do all two. at once. And, uh, okay. <laughs> we'll keep them very short questions yeah. and very short answers. Good. Okay. Uh, my name is Tassi Valoy from Mozambique. Uh, Rafael, how is the current situation with the people who have been detained by Jose Eduardo is a regime? Because you know that some of them uh, are even about to lose their lives. Yeah. And as we we'll always say, a luta continue and uh, we'll keep a struggle in order to have a better account and uh, get rid of this kind of regime. Thank you. And let's take the other question. You can answer them both. The other question is, uh, see, when, when you got arrested in 1999 and when your conviction happened in May, uh, who carried on your work? Do you have a second line? What happens to Maka Angola when, uh, when you are under so much of pressure and trouble in the sense that the journey has to go on, the story has to go on? So who, do, who does it when, when you cannot at some point? Okay. Yes. Um, on the first question, uh, the youth remain in prison. One of them, uh, a rapper, Luati Beraun, is, uh, and um, there's fear that he might lose his life because he's on the 19th day of his hunger strike. Uh, and again, his crime was for just uh, studying these books on uh, nonviolence. Uh, and of course the regime wants to punish them any way it can to send a message to society that anyone challenging their authority will end up in jail. Uh, the second question on um, who carries out the work. Uh, during my trial, my website had also been attacked and was out of service for nearly a month or two. Uh, to my surprise, the number of uh, articles on me and on my work uh, had just increased exponentially because I was not able to publish. And I didn't ask people to publish. I think there was just this natural sense of solidarity that others try to give um, uh, as much information as they could on the work I do and uh, on the case in itself. So in that sense, uh, I can also say that um, I've been quite lucky to be able to create a space in which, you know, even when I'm uh, out of service, uh, others can continue to talk about it and uh, raise some of these issues because it just becomes a sort of uh, catalyst for others to stand up and say, well, if Raphael is not here, we will continue to do so. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there are many good journalists in Angola and outlets who, uh, in situations of uh, greater pressure, also come out and show uh, that they can be strong and uh, they can keep going. And um, in that sense, I think uh, Mac Angola is only a contribution that enables, um, is a catalyst for others also to come forth and do their part. Okay. Well, I think we could all listen to you talk for hours, and I wish that we could. Um, we'll have to stop here. Um, but I just want to say, I, I think on behalf of everyone here, that you are really an inspiration to all of us. Um, we, uh, you've asked for our solidarity, and I think all of us here and everyone who watches on live streaming is going to give you that. Um, I think we should all pledge to do whatever we can to help Rafael and his, and, and all of your brothers and sisters who are, are doing the work that you're doing in very repressive places. So I thank you, Rafael, for this amazing talk. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.